Hey guys, welcome back to the YouTube channel. Today I want to talk about the modern state of entertainment. Not just movies, not just TV, music, everything. I want to talk about entertainment as a whole. Because while it may seem that entertainment is bigger than ever, it's more available than it's ever been with streaming. It's not always the better option and it's not always evident that streaming and even entertainment is as big as the biggest it's ever been. So I want to talk a bit about the old days how you would gauge how popular something is, how big of an impact it's having. Now, Espresso is a big song by Sabrina Carpenter. Everyone online and everyone in a certain age demographic will know Sabrina Carpenter. Espresso is the big song at the moment. It's everywhere. But, yeah, while Sabrina is relatively new on the scene, I don't think your grandparents are going to know who Sabrina Carpenter is. They may know who Taylor Swift is because Taylor Swift has kind of transcended but back in the day when these were radio and on radio and on TV and it was just non-stop playing and then they were on every news cycle. Stars like Michael Jackson, stars like even Freddie Mercury and Queen, like they would be household names. Literally when their biggest song came out, you would know, okay, that is Michael Jackson. Okay, that's Freddie Mercury of Queen. Okay, that's Madonna. You know, you could instantly tell who you were listening to even if you didn't even know the song. Now, Espresso, a lot of people know Espresso. A lot of people are aware that Espresso is a big song. A lot of people may even be aware that it is Sabrina Carpenter singing. But when you look at it, it doesn't have the transcending effect that old media used to have, that the radio used to have, that even CD used to have. When CDs came out, artists would have to really sell you on the idea of buying their album because albums were an expense and... When Billboard was analysing, okay, who's selling the most albums, of course people wanted rankings on Billboard. But these days it's all streaming. It's all how many times a song is streamed rather than the album overall. And a lot of, a lot of artists will just release a single ahead of time and not even bother with an album for years on end. Now, why do I mention Sabrina Carpenter? Because it's the big song at the moment, as I mentioned. But also, it shows the contrast between a Michael Jackson, between a Madonna, between even a Britney Spears, and what is currently the template. Now, Sabrina is someone who is new to the scene. Don't get me wrong, she's been around for a minute. But in terms of she is not a worldwide phenomenon at the moment, at least in terms of what Taylor Swift might be, you know? And a lot of people will know Taylor Swift. As I said, she transcended. Taylor Swift was kind of the last of that... Look, Taylor Swift was around at an era where CDs were still selling, where people were still going out, buying CDs, buying records. In fact, she even encourages her fans to buy, hey, here's the physical media, I'll have four different covers. If you buy them all, you can have certain little, little benefits. But this is the thing. That's the modern state of music. And when it comes down to streams and how many times a thing is streamed, you can't really gauge what's popular because, yeah, something might be catchy and then within a week it'll be moved on. Things like My Heart Will Go On when Titanic came out, like Celine Dion, she was on the radio for like 6 to 12 months when that song came out. And when Titanic was really cooking in the cinemas, it was really picking up and that thing sold more tickets than anything. That sold almost as many tickets as Gone With The Wind over the span of 70 odd years. So when you gauge popularity, streaming is not always a great thing to gauge it. Back in the day, we used to have these sort of things, even with cinema. We don't have those big movie stars anymore. I mean, you could say Arnold Schwarzenegger, Tom Cruise. Everyone can probably name about five movies from each of those guys. Even Sylvester Stallone. You can name, you can usually go, to, oh yeah, I liked um, Rocky. Oh yeah, you know, Rambo. And you know, you can usually list, list down a bunch of movies from these people. And if you said, okay, Chris Evans, maybe people can name about five. And I'm not talking just about cinema girls. I'm not talking about film fans who are like, oh, I like the, I like the actor. I'm talking about the general audience. The general audience could name, okay, Chris Evans was in the Avengers and uh, Fantastic Four and, you know, beyond a certain point, people are not going to necessarily be able to name it if they're not in the film space. Now, when you go to people like Tom Cruise, they're going to say, oh yeah, Tom Cruise, he was in Top Gun, he was in Mission Impossible, you know, Tom Cruise was a big movie star. He was in risky business. Like people can instantly think of things and that's how you gauge popularity of films. Now obviously people stream things. People can stream, people can come in, people can watch it. But it used to be an event where people would go to the cinemas and say, okay, 
Word of mouth is that Top Gun is a great movie. I better go and see Top Gun. I better go and see the new Mission Impossible. Like, it's making big headlines. Now, we did see a, we did see a glimpse of what used to be with movies like Inside Out and also Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer and Barbie were big cultural impact movies. But you don't have those big cultural impact movies. They're few and far between. They're not as coming out weekly or coming out once a year like they used to be. Like, when Titanic came out, it was a cultural phenomenon. It wasn't just, okay, here's a James Cameron movie. It wasn't like Avatar. Like, Avatar made a lot of money. Avatar 2, I'm talking about, the newest one. It made a lot of money. Don't get me wrong. It was a phenomenon. But it wasn't like everybody... It, like, Titanic stuck around in the cinemas for like a year. It was still in cinemas. When it came out on VHS, it was still in the cinemas. And I think it came out on VHS in September 1998, a full year, or almost a full year, after it came out at the cinemas. And they were still playing it in the cinema and selling out sessions at that time. Because when you look at the cult phenomenon of entertainment, when a movie's selling, they will leave it in that cinema as long as possible. Whereas the modern template is that they've got to race it to streaming. We've got to race it to streaming. Okay, nobody's going to subscribe to Disney Plus if we leave Inside Out in cinemas, Inside Out 2 in cinemas for six months. They really should have left Inside Out in cinemas for as long as possible. But I understand, look, Disney's a business, for example. They want people on their streaming service. But when you have a culturally impactful movie like Inside Out that I personally haven't seen, I'm not the core demographic, but when people are going to see it, why would you do anything different to hurt that template? Yes, it can go onto a streaming service and you may pick up a bit of that market. But people are saying, hey, I'm good with parting with my hard-earned money to go and experience this in a cinema. Leave it in the cinemas. I don't get why it's such a race to get it out of the cinemas onto a streaming service that isn't profitable. And while, yeah, we're saying, okay, it's streaming, streaming is kind of becoming profitable with ads. Not everyone's going to have the ad tier. When you put it online, the first thing that's going to happen is it's going to get leaked to the Pirate Bay within like an hour of it being online. So... I don't understand why it's such a rush to get things out of the cinema to get them onto a streaming service. Now, when a movie's failing at the box office, there is, contrary to that, is, yeah, you want to get it onto a streaming service because no one's going to the cinemas. Shawshank Redemption, for example, did not make its money back in cinemas. You might think of that as this odd fact now, like, oh, Shawshank Redemption is one of the most critically acclaimed, or I don't know about critically acclaimed, but audience acclaimed best movies of all time. And it didn't make its money back. It didn't make its money back in cinemas. People did not go to the cinemas to watch it. But when it came out of the video shops, Blockbuster, Video Easy, when it came out on VHS, people were renting it. It was the number one rental of 1995. And from there, obviously, it became a cult phenomenon because people were obviously word of mouth had spread like this is a really good movie. But that's how you get a audience. That's that's another thing. You could gauge it of how popular it was at the video sh shops. When you'd go into a video shop, I don't know if every video shop had this experience, but when you were, when you're getting new releases, you'd have a f almost a full shelf of like the big movie. Like Titanic had a full shelf of Titanic releases at my video store, Video Easy, and you could actually gauge how popular something was by how many copies were rented at any given time. And Titanic, when it first came out, there was literally no copies of like they would have the copy behind that you take, so you'd get the tape from behind. The cover was always the one you don't rent. You get the cover from behind, has like the Video Easy logo and the little frame of a little uh, poster of the movie on it. And you'd have that whole experience of like, okay, this movie must be good because it's got 14 different copies and they're all rented. That's how you could actually gauge popularity if you weren't seeing it in the cinemas or watching the box office. If you heard nothing about a movie, if you went into a video shop every week and let's say, I don't know, let's just say you rented out... Let's just say Shine was on the shelf, and every time you went to rent Shine, it was out of out of stock, so someone was renting it. You could usually gauge it as like, okay, that must be a good movie because that copy is always gone. Someone is always watching that movie. But you don't get that anymore because streaming is always available. Streaming is always at your fingertips. Streaming is always there. And yes, while people might say, this is the number one most popular thing, you have to doubt it sometimes because it's like, of course you're going to say, okay, our newest series that we just launched a day ago, of course it's the number one most watched thing on Netflix or on Disney or whatever, because we just launched it. We want you to watch it. Even if the stats might, might not necessarily back that up, we don't know because a lot of these stats are private. 
yeah, they might be saying that just to make sure that, hey, we want as many people viewing this. And of course, when people come onto the service, they're going to be going towards it. But it's not the same as making a sale. Getting people onto a streaming service, they have access to everything. So they could say, oh, well, we've seen our subscriber numbers go up. And you're going to have a baseline. You're going to have your baseline of regular subscribers who will keep on Disney year round. You'll have your ones who come in for like a, um, let's say Amazon, you'll have your spikes with the boys, you'll have your spikes with Fallout, you'll have your spikes with Halo and so on. But then you'll have the valleys where it kind of peaks down, like even Netflix would have seen this with Stranger Things where so many people subscribe for Stranger Things and then it just falls off cliff. It's literally the moment Stranger Things ends, it goes off of cliff, the ratings and the subscriber count. And you'll keep your baseline, it'll go back down to baseline. And this is how ratings used to work on TV. You'd see like your regular audience, like people talk about AEW, uh, All Elite Wrestling. I've been looking at the stats of that and they've recently announced a TV deal. I think Eric Bischoff had a really good take of like, they announced it was like a hundred and something million dollars. Eric Bischoff mentioned that, hey, is it all cash? Like how much of that is cash and how much of it is advertising? Like television works very differently. Obviously they can advertise like, okay, we'll give you X amount of ads on the, on the Warner Brothers networks or whatever. The the Turner Networks. So you'll have that whole experience and you'll have, okay, it's a $50 million cash deal, but with that. Now, I'm looking at AEW in terms of the ratings because I'm like, okay, how popular is it at the moment? I'm not knocking AEW, but if you're looking at the stats and seeing it going off a cliff, essentially, after a certain point in time, you start looking at, okay, so who's getting over with the fans? The fans come on during MJF segments, so the, the, uh, the viewer count goes up. They kind of drop off at some segments come back for like a Chris Jericho segment, fall off again, come back for Moxley, might go up a bit, bit down. But you know, you can watch the trends and see who's popular in those ratings. Now, obviously when WWE goes to Netflix, I'm sure that'll be a lot harder to see like who's getting over. Like Jey Uso, when he comes on, I'm sure the count goes up because he's very popular. He's very trendy at the moment. He's very in fashion. He's very in, in the know. People are watching for Jey Uso, the Intercontinental Champion. I'm sure the world champion, uh, Gunther, will also get a good rating. Cody Rhodes when he's on TV, Roman Reigns, The Rock, you know. When The Rock was on TV, now obviously The Rock is a household name, don't get me wrong. But you could watch when that uh, WrestleMania, post-WrestleMania segment where they went for like 40 minutes or something because The Rock does what The Rock wants to do. You could just watch the, the, uh, the ratings and I was watching it on the next day when it was like, when they were releasing all the stats. And you just watch the ratings go up for that first segment because it's like The Rock is on TV and people were tuning in to watch The Rock. And then the moment, almost the moment when that segment ended, the viewership kind of dwindled down, but it wasn't necessarily immediately a fall off for Raw. So what that led me to believe is that people still wanted to see the product. People were like, okay, I'm already here. Yes, you lost about maybe 600,000 that maybe were just there for The Rock. But it wasn't like everyone just switched off. It was like, okay, I have seen the ROG segment. Show me what you got, WWE. And this is the thing. AEW can do the same thing. AEW can show us and they have to get, they have to peak interest again. Like I'm not watching it week to week. I'll keep an ear out for like the Moxley, what the Moxley is doing. Keep an ear out for what Jericho is doing. Keep an ear out for what MJF is doing. But I'm not watching week to week. Now I'm aware that M, uh, MVP is over there at the moment. I'm aware that Sheldon Benjamin came in. And when Bobby Lashley, look, Bobby Lashley's probably going to come into AEW. When he shows up, I might say, okay, I want to see what Bobby Lashley is going to do. I'm checking it out. I'm keeping that in the back of my mind that it's coming and maybe heading that route. But I am necessarily waiting to see, okay, what are they going to do with him? Like, what, where are we going with this? And that's the thing. I will watch the interest in the product and then make my decision if I want to invest my time into watching that. And AW is in good shape. Like they have the new TV deal. That means it's going to have a TV deal for the foreseeable future for the next few years. It also gives them a chance to really increase that. I mean, yeah, they talk about a hundred and something million, this deal. Um, perhaps the next deal might be 500 million if they do really well and can increase that viewership. They're doing a pay-per-view in Australia in, I believe, February. They're doing one in Brisbane, which I don't know why they're holding it in Brisbane. They could have easily done it in Sydney or even Melbourne. Melbourne is a big city that is very popular with wrestling. It's where a lot of um, a lot of wrestlers are, a lot of good wrestling companies down there. There's a lot of good wrestling companies in Sydney as well. Brisbane has a wrestling scene, but I just don't know if they could sell at Suncorp Stadium. I mean, I'm sure they will have to analyze that, but 
it just didn't make sense to me that they would kind of avoid Sydney and Melbourne. It seems like the logical thing for an AEW to run Sydney, or at least Mel Melbourne or Sydney. Like, I'll give them credit for that. It's like when WWE ran um, Elimination Chamber in Perth. They sold out 50,000 seats or whatever it was. But if they put that in the MCG or in uh, a core stadium, it would have been an 80 to 100,000 crowd easily for an Elimination Chamber pay-per-view. Now, the reason they couldn't do it in Melbourne or Sydney was because the Taylor Swift concert was in town and I went to the Eras tour. <laughs> but, you know, there's this whole thing of like, how you gauge the product is how popular it is with the audience. Now, if you're seeing constant images of, okay, AEW can barely fill the stadium, it can barely fill all seats. I'm not necessarily looking at how many seats it's filling. I'm looking at, okay, it's not putting people in the seats, but you know, rugby league, for example, in Australia, the national rugby league, they don't put people in seats either. Yeah, they get their core thing for the um, the core audience for the teams, but it's not necessarily selling out like the AFL is. There's no incentive. Like NRL isn't really giving incentives for families to go. Like they're doing a lot of things wrong when it comes to marketing people into the stadium. And that's the thing. It's like, I'm not necessarily looking at that. I'm looking at the whole package of like, okay, they might not be going to the stadium, but what's it rating on Channel 9? What's it rating on Fox Sports? What's... What, how many people are watching it at any given time? And by that, that's why the NRL got their, their uh, rights deal. That's why they got a really good rights deal. AFL got a really good rights deal as well, but that's because AFL is hugely pop popular in Australia. But do you understand what I'm saying? Like, there are many different aspects to analysing how popular something is and how modern entertainment and modern sports and modern everything is doing. Like, if no one's watching that golf tournament, the LIV Live Golf, you know, the uh, Saudi-backed golf tournament, I don't think they're going to get a rights deal. Like, I could see them, like, really a lot of networks were kind of sceptical of that at first. And I can see that whole thing burning out. I can see it kind of going away. Now, obviously, Saudi money has, Saudi have a lot of money, so they could easily pay a network to say, hey, if you just keep it on ESPN, like, we'll pay you $100 million a year just to keep it on the network get people aware of the product. I could see that happening. Like that is something I don't think Live Golf is going to find itself without a network. But I think it's one of those situations of like, if no one's watching it, if no one's viewing it, yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. It can be basically advertising at that point. They can sell it as advertising. But even when I'm talking about even games and TV shows, like remember when Lost came out and how big ever, now I don't know if you're old enough some of my fans may not be old enough to remember this. But 2004, Lost came out and it was a cultural phenomenon. It was everywhere. Everyone the next day was talking about, did you watch Lost last night? Did you watch Lost? Like, did you watch the plane crash and all the other stuff? Like, what do you reckon that is? What do you reckon this is? Like, it was... Now, you do have that somewhat extent to, uh, like, the boys were releasing weekly. Some things released weekly. Again, they went back to the weekly format because they figured out okay, how are we going to have a cultural phenomenon show if we don't allow time and everyone's on different points of the show? Like, it made sense for net, for people like Netflix and people like Amazon to go back to a weekly format. Now, Netflix is still doing a drop all at once. That's how they tend to market. But with the boys, people were actually talking about it the next day, like, oh, where do you think the Homelander story is going? Where do you think this is going? And people were going, oh, but the comic books, you know, yeah. I mean, The Walking Dead showed us that comic books, in terms of the source material, it's not always honoured, but I think um, they're still going that way. But back in the day, you could actually tell what was making waves in television. You could tell what was making ground, what was catching with the audience, what was culturally a phenomenon. And that's the same with games. Like, when The Last of Us came out, everybody talked about The Last of Us. Everybody talked about Grand Theft Auto when Grand Theft Auto came out. Everyone was talking about Red Dead Redemption. Like, you know, there are certain games that just bring the audience and you can tell, okay, everybody's talking about it. It must be good or it must be something. Now, give or take, YouTube has really changed the format with that with, in terms of you can watch people game that, play that game and essentially enjoy it that way without actually buying the game. And at cost of living crisis, a lot of people are going towards that format. But do you understand how entertainment isn't the same as it used to be? Like... I've heard so many people say that back in the day, it was, so, it was so much harder and now I have access to everything. Yeah, you have access to everything, but it's like, what is really popular? What? Yeah, well, I've said a couple of times, one of my things about the physical media collection is that I can choose what I want to watch at any given time. 
I'm not necessarily being controlled by, hey, number one stream on Netflix. This is the number one program. You need to watch it because it's number one. And yeah, while you can avoid that, you can, you can make the effort to avoid that show. I could say, okay, I want to watch Halo. But here's the thing, how you can tell if it's gay, how you can gauge if Halo is a popular series. Going to JB Hi-Fi, look how many copies are on the shelf. If I know this is sold out, I'm like, okay, people are checking it out, so I might have to get that. Breaking Bad would have been the same thing when that came out on Blu-ray. If everyone were buying out copies of Breaking Bad, then you'd be like, okay, Breaking Bad must be a good show, like, I better check it out. And word of mouth as well. Word of mouth was always really good to Breaking Bad. Same with The Sopranos, same with any TV show. But do you understand what I'm saying? Like, you could gauge how popular something was by how many people are talking over it and how big a star. Like, Brian Cranston was a star at the time. He did Malcolm in the Middle prior to Breaking Bad. But when people stopped calling him, oh, do you know Brian Cranston playing the science teacher? When they stopped talking about it like that and saying, did you watch Heisenberg last night? That's when you knew it transcended. And I didn't come in until about season four or five. Like, I came in late to Breaking Bad because I was like, oh, you know, I don't even know if I really want to watch it. Like, I didn't come in until late because it was like four or five seasons in. And then I was just like, I'll just wait till the show's over. And I came in right before the last season. I remember I started watching right before the last season or just after. And I just binged them all in one go. And I was like, damn, I should have been watching that week to week. So when Better Call Saul came around, I didn't make that same mistake. I was like, I have to watch them when they're coming out. I have to watch them week to week. But do you understand what I'm saying? Like, you could gauge how popular something was. You could gauge how big a star someone was when they started saying, okay, they're not calling him Brian Cranston anymore. They're calling him Heisenberg. The same can be said with Tom Cruise. Like, I mean, you know, when you watch, probably a bad, probably bad analogy. Like, you can tell when you watch Mission Impossible, people say, oh, Mission Impossible, Tom Cruise. But what's a thing like Marvel movies? They, at a certain point, they stopped calling him Robert Downey Jr. And the audience just started calling him, oh, Iron Man. That's when you knew Robert Downey Jr. transcended with the audience. And look, I started with this video talking about Sabrina Carpenter. I am a big fan of how she's doing her template. Like she has really nailed what she's doing at the moment. And she needs to keep doing what she's doing because I have, think she has the ability to really transcend. She has the same, the same format that Taylor Swift used and the same format that Britney used in the past. Same format that so many people, Ariana Grande, so many people use it. And she has that ability. So I think she needs to keep doing what she's doing. She's doing great work. But she hasn't transcended yet. And that's what I mean. If her biggest hit is Espresso, back in the day, you would have everybody in the world would know, oh, Espresso, that's Sabrina Carpenter. These days, you could they'll say, oh, I know that song on TV. Like if, pe if it came on TV, people might not necessarily immediately associate with Sabrina Carpenter. Back in the day, it was, it was clear who was singing what song. You hear Britney, there's a pretty clear voice there. But... Also, they'll be like, oh, this must be Britney Spears. You could also say like Backstreet Boys, you had a certain style of song in sync. You could tell a certain style of song and you could instantly associate it because people knew the stars rather than the music. And you could go, okay, I know Justin Timberlake. I know in sync. I know JC, you know? <laughs> JC doesn't get a bigger rap in that in sync conversation. But you know what I'm saying? The modern state of entertainment has changed, and you can see it by stuff like The Joker and Megapolis or whatever the Francis Ford Coppola movie is. People aren't no, necessarily going to the cinemas to watch them because the word of mouth has spread that these are pretty bad movies and people are not going to go and watch subpar. Now, there's going to be a certain portion of the audience is that your baseline is going to go and see those movies regardless. But it's not everybody. No, the general audience is like, oh, I'll just wait till it comes to streaming. I don't care. But then people would look at the streaming numbers. And if those streaming numbers aren't picking up, then the studios will look at themselves and say, like, okay, uh, we better not approve a... We better not approve that again. Like, that didn't do any do any good. But, you know, obviously, Joker and Megapolis, whatever it's called, is not... They're not necessarily looking for a part three or part two or whatever. Now, if the next Avatar movie came out and James Cameron was like, okay, here's Avatar 3 and I've got two more, three more movies in the pipeline. If that failed at the box office, uh, Disney might really look at that and Fox, or not Fox, what was Fox under the Disney brand? Um, 20th Century Studios might look at that as like, okay, um, that failed big time. We lost 400 million on that movie. Um, we better not approve something that big ever again. And that's the thing, if a movie fails at the box office, a lot of times, because streaming isn't profitable, they will not issue a part three or four or whatever. 
Now, something like Goodwill Hunting made its money back through sales of DVDs and VHS back in the day. Like Matt Damon has talked about, you would get a bigger cut of the percentage and they knew that it was hitting with its audience when it came to that format, when it came to physical media, because they were selling for more physical media. Now, I don't know if that's necessarily anything useful for everyone. I feel like I've ranted for probably half hour about everything. But um, yeah, let me know if you take anything away from this. You know, I just wanted to do a talk today about how entertainment's changed and why I feel that so many things have went wrong in the industry that, look, we don't make movie stars like we used to. And I think most people would agree that like you don't have those big household names anymore. Like you have The Rock. I mentioned The Rock in this. The Rock is a household name. He came in an era where the audience was inflated for wrestling, but also he broke out in a time where movies were still like in cinemas for longer, where things would come to video like blockbuster and you'd be like, okay, Scorpion King must be rented out. Um, I'm, There's a copy there. I might just check it out. People necessarily would say what they did about Scorpion King, but it was, you know, I'll put the rock on the map. Like, obviously, he came in in The Mummy too, but Scorpion King was, like, the big... I mean, he had Walking to the Jungle before that. And then um, Walking Tall came out around the same time. But everyone just started calling him the Scorpion King at the start of his career because that's what people knew him from. Oh, Scorpion King. Obviously, they knew him from The Rock from the wrestling, but let's say you weren't a wrestling fan and you were like, oh, yeah, I know The Rock, but whatever. But then when he did The Scorpion King, they are like, oh, Scorpion King. And now, obviously, he's transcended again as... I mean, look, Black Adam lost money, but a lot of people now call him Black Adam. Like, it's like, oh, Black Adam. <laughs> I've seen people calling him Black Adam, and that's really a throw-off. I'm like, hold on, did that transcend? Like, it lost money at the box office, but I think it was the number one most watched thing on HBO or whatever. Like, it was just insane. Like, The Rock can still transcend, but also, you know, The Rock is the Rock is not struggling for audience. Anyway, anyways, guys, I feel like I've rented on. Um, let me know what you think. If I hit any topics in this video, let me know. And um, yeah, I'll try to get back to some of you in the next one. Peace.